the book of Matthew tells us that as Jesus was walking by the lakeside, he called to the fishermen Peter and Andrew, and then to James and John. He called them to follow him, to throw in their lot with him. And after he had chosen the rest of his 12 disciples, Jesus then chose Galilee as the place to begin his ministry of teaching and proclaiming the gospel, the good news. As he preached, he also healed all manners of illness. So it's little wonder that great crowds of people began to follow Jesus as he walked. And in today's reading from Matthew, Jesus has taken his disciples up with him, away and up to the mountain. And up there on the mountain, he sat down with his disciples, and he began some really intensive small group instruction. <laughs> all about the kingdom of God. Jesus was speaking to, he was talking to faithful Jews, people who knew who God is and how God had indeed provided for them. After all, God had provided Abraham, Moses, King David to lead his people. However, many of God's beloved people had begun to forget what they knew about God and what they knew about his enduring love. Jesus was teaching to them in desperate times. Desperate times for the Jews because they struggled under the cruel domination system of the Romans. So Jesus spoke with very direct, emphatic words. He wanted to make sure his point was clear. And he said, look guys, don't worry about things. Don't be anxious. Don't distrust God. Isn't there more to your life than worrying about things? Don't stress out, guys, he said. Now, when he said that, I don't think that Jesus meant that the disciples could just lay back and expect food and clothing and shelter to just magically appear. He did not expect a whatever attitude. Rather, remember that Jesus is talking to a Jewish audience. A very prudent people who expected their sons to learn a trade. After all, James and John were fishermen. They were men who were proud that they could earn a living. And because they had a trade to rely on, I think that the disciples of Jesus had the necessities of life. They were not homeless. They were not facing eviction. They were not struggling with the aftermath hurricane or earthquakes. They weren't jobless. They weren't without money or means to feed and shelter their family. The disciples had the necessities. In other words, they had what they needed. So what was Jesus talking about then? Well, what Jesus forbade, what he said not to do, was to worry excessively you know, anxiety, when anxiety builds up, we feel so alone and overwhelmed with worry. And Jesus is telling them that this degree of worry, that stress of anxiety, is pointless. It's useless. Because it doesn't change a thing. Unless the health, the state of your health. That it would change. So what Jesus wants his disciples and us to do is to place our lives in God's hands and do God's will and trust him. Because when we place our lives in the hands of God and when we rely on the power of God's love, our anxiety begins to reduce. And the problem with anxiety is this. Anxiety becomes debilitating and obsessing and then it drives out our concern for others. It drives our concern for our friends. It drives our concern for our neighbors. And excessive worry, anxiety, Jesus tells us, is really a distrust of God. And Jesus wants the opposite for us. He wants us to strengthen our trust in God. He wants us to rely on God. He wants us to put ourselves in the hands of God. Then he wants us to take a really good look around us and to look at our abundant blessings. But Jesus is talking.
talking about is faith. Our faith and belief in the kingdom of God and in doing the will of God, of looking out for our neighbors. And the disciples took his message to heart. They followed the example that Jesus set. They placed their lives in the hands of God and did God's will. They were extraordinary Christians, like other extraordinary Christians, extraordinary Christians like Mother Teresa, Oscar Romero, Dorothy Day, Rosa Parks, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Desmond Tutu. Extraordinary Christians, all of them. But on this Thanksgiving Eve, what brings, me, brings to mind for me is a group of people who felt themselves to be very ordinary Christians. Ordinary Christians who placed their trust in God and fled from religious conflict in England, and then they fled to Holland. And from Holland, the separatists sailed for the New World. They headed for the colony of Southern Virginia, and by chance, in late November of the year 1620, these separatists, whom we call, now call pilgrims, landed in a natural harbor on a very bleak, cold, and northwestern windswept tip of Cape Cod, not Southern Virginia. And then history tells us that that ship, the Mayflower, had landed in an area that had belonged to the Patuxets. And the Patuxets were a fierce group of people who took intense delight in murdering anybody who happened to walk onto their territory. But the Patuxets no longer lived there because an epidemic had decimated the people. So consequently, the pilgrims were able to claim that cleared land, and by chance, they were able to claim an abandoned cache of corn, their first taste of Indian corn. Unfortunately for them, the winter of 1620 was harsh, it was cruel, and they were unprepared. So only 50 of the original 101 pilgrims survived. But again, by chance, their nearest neighbors were the Wampamnoa. And the Wampamnoa people were a much more peaceful people. They were farmers, and they cultivated the three sisters. Do you remember the three sisters? Squash, beans, and corn. And by chance, Squanto, who lived there was a lone survivor of the fierce Patuxets. Okay, of the fierce Patuxets. But Squanto spoke a little bit of English because six years earlier he had been captured and enslaved by a ship's captain who took him to Europe. And eventually a group of monks freed him and Squanto returned to his home only to discover that his family, his friends, and all of his people had died in the great plague. Then tradition says that Squanto, that Squanto, that same man who had been captured and enslaved by the Europeans, he whose family had been decimated by illness, that very same Squanto looked not with anger or bitterness, but he looked with compassion on his suffering pilgrim neighbors. And he chose to teach them how to cultivate and grow corn. He taught them to plant five kernels of corn with one small fish to fertilize it. He taught them to take one ear of corn, and I understand the corn was about that size back then. He taught them to take this one ear of corn, and if you can figure, you'll get about a hundred plants corn plants out of this ear of corn, you'll get about a hundred ears of corn. So he taught the pilgrims to increase this one ear of corn by one hundred fold and abundance. Ordinary corn, but a very extraordinary man. And the following summer of 1621, brought a bounty of food for the pilgrims. 
but the pilgrims had not yet perfected the art of cultivation in this new world, and consequently, for nearly two years, they endured what they called the starving times. And according to the journals of Governor Bradford, the pilgrims, including Governor Bradford himself, were often restricted to one-fourth of a loaf of bread per day. And when food was really scarce, they lived for four or five days at a time on a few grains of corn. Legend says that it was five grains of corn. History records that none of the pilgrims died of starvation during those times. The pilgrims persevered. And I believe they persevered because of their character, their hope. But most importantly, they persevered because of their faith and trust in God. And the harvest of 1623 was abundant. And again, legend tells us that in the fall of 1623, the pilgrims celebrated the day of Thanksgiving and invited their neighbors to be their guests. The preparations for the feast included an abundance, an abundance of meat, an abundance of fruit, an abundance of vegetables, an abundance of nuts, and even an abundance of desserts. Maybe pies? I don't know. <laughs> Could be. But when the pilgrims and their guests sat down, they sat down at the table to empty plates. And they sat down to empty plates to remind everyone of the hard times they had endured. And then, legend says again, each person was given five kernels of corn. Five kernels of corn to remind them of how much they had to be thankful for, to remind them of their great abundance. Now after this service, when it's over, I'm gonna give each of you a bag five kernels of corn in it. And as you sit down to your Thanksgiving meal, I invite you to count the kernels of corn and remember your hard times when your worries were excessive. And then, recall the good news, the words of Jesus when he said, don't be anxious. And then, Think about the times that you believe and you put your faith in God and you put your faith in Him and not yourself. And then, then give thanks for your blessings, for your great abundance of blessings. Amen. Amen. Amen.